me start my concurrent Instagram live. All right. Welcome to my open studio stream for October 15th. Today I'm going to be working on hopefully finishing up this hat right here. I have half, well, two thirds of the trim pinned out on it. I have the remainder of it here to finish stabilizing and then it goes in this place here at the back and then that'll be it. Well, I might have to sew a label into it. I guess we'll see when I take it off of this head. So that's the first plan is finishing up this hat. And then if there's time, which I always overestimate how productive I'm going to be, but if there's time, this week I got a donation of some vintage hats and some straw braid, and I hope to unspiral the braid that has been used to create this interesting open crown design sort of pillbox shape. Spiral that back to the border of this medallion here and start working in this donated braid to create my goal is a Regency style bonnet because in March I'm going to be giving a lecture to a lifelong learning program in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the theme of that is, I think it's maybe six weeks with a different professional each week giving a lecture on something to do with Jane Austen and fashion and so forth. I see that I have some friends over in the Instagram chat. So, hi. Oh, I see it's, it's Danielle and a couple other people who are not listed, two others joined. Welcome. I am concurrently streaming on Instagram Live and YouTube Live. So I, it's going to be hard for me to keep track of both of the chats, but uh, I'm going to try. This is exciting. I finally figured out my orientation on Instagram here. And I'm landscape on YouTube and I'm... Um, portrait on Instagram and the cameras are slightly askew from each other so I apologize that sometimes I'm going to be talking to one audience and another time I'll be talking to the other viewing audience. But back to what I was saying is if I can finish this Tim Burton, let me bring it over here so that the folks on Instagram can see it. It's kind of a Tim Burton inspired triton, bicorn with brew. Um, and I'm just securing that trim. So if I can get that done, the next thing I'm doing is this antique hat. I want to unspiral the braid. See, it's very easy because this has been stitched on a chain stitch straw braid machine, which makes it super simple to undo. And I'm gonna spiral this back to here, start a new spiral straw construction of a bonnet shape that is inspired by the bonnet shapes of the Regency period because I'm giving this lecture in March. It is, the theme is Jane Au fashion in the time of Jane Austen, and um, it's a lifelong learning program. So these are retired, uh, predominantly retired senior citizens who just are interested in this topic. And um, why are you talking? Why are you taking it apart? Uh, because I, I want the majority of the bonnet to be made out of this wider natural straw braid. Um, that is, to my mind, more accurate to that time period that I'm trying to evoke in this hat because it's gonna be a visual aid for that lecture because I'm talking about hats and gloves and parasols. Um, and so this braid is really skinny and that's more of a 20th century type of braid width. I could, I mean, I'm sure you could find maybe evidence that I'm making an incorrect judgment there, but I predominantly see spiral straight, spiral braid hats with this narrow, like kind of like a fat eighth of an inch, with this narrow stuff in the 20th century. And I want to retain this artistic medallion there on the end, at the top of the crown of the bonnet. So I'm just gonna use this as like, we call it the button 
of the hat where there's a central medallion and this braid that is going to make up the rest of it that's more accurate to the period it, it'd be really hard to to do a tight spiral at the center of that hat so this solves that problem for me with this beautiful straw configuration um, it's sort of floral and reminiscent and and air passes through there so the bonnet the person's heat from their head will go out through this um, so that's hopefully that answers your question as to why um, I'm going to be using this narrow braid thanks for asking that gosh I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm pulled in two directions because there's action going on in both places um, but I, I will I will leave you to talk amongst yourselves because I still have to secure the other um, ornament so here you see the one that I did last week in the stream and stabilized it all and I've pinned it out and I like it and I want that to be mirrored on this side here um, and I got far enough to stabilize one end of it last time and I had only pinned out the other one so I, I need to stabilize where these pins are and then pin it out and then stitch it on and it's really only going to be a few tacks for both of these. I think I talked last time about how you don't really want to nail your trim onto a hat in a whole bunch of places so that it's like sewn down in every possible place because you want the millinery to have an airy sense to it that um, I think my first millinery teacher ever said that it should look like there was just flowers and ribbons blowing by in a breeze and it got landed on the hat and it could just blow away at any moment. Uh, that that was the, the, the goal aesthetically is you, you wanted it to look that way and that's why you don't really nail it on there. So that's, uh, that has worked well for me. I think it, it winds up being more graceful in appearance. Um, I have already threaded my needle so that you guys don't have to, um, that you don't have to wait for blind me to figure out how to get a piece of thread through this needle. I think at some point I'm going to get some needle threaders because I always complain about how bad my eyesight is. That has always been the case. Um, and I, I try to preempt some of the delay of that by, um, in this case, pre-threading my needle. But of course I'm going to have to thread it up in, in black as well once I start sewing this trim onto this hat in places where you see the stitching on the black braid side. So it's it's really only a stopgap, I know. I am, so I have these three pins here. And I spoke in the stream last time about how when you have a ribbon trim like this on a hat, you wind up orient, if you want a, a a sort of organic look to it instead of something very stable and symmetrical which as a theatrical milliner you know sometimes you want one and sometimes you want the other but um, I for this hat want to err on the side of sophistication if at all possible because we're already sort of treading a fine line with how gothic tim burton the black and white stripes with the red ornamentation are um, and so I, I i want to maximize the sophistication of the trim and um, this is another tip that i believe it was my first millinery teacher um, told me is if you have a loop like this where you have pleats on both ends and you're going to turn it into this fake half of the bow here that you see. Um, trying to show it to everybody. Um, you put your pleats oriented down on one end and up on the other end. So they're, they're knife pleats. And that differentiation of the pleat orientation allows it, when you assemble it into the bow loop, to just have a, a, a less regimental, stable look to the trim. Um, so I'm doing that this time. And I'm almost done with that stabilizing, so I can then pin it out. Let's see. Got two 
of my three pleats stabilized. Now, if you're just joining the stream, in normal times, I am the milliner and crafts artisan at Playmakers Repertory Company in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is a professional theater there. We're uh, actors' equity contracts with our performers, um, union designers, and so forth. But of course, we're dark right now. And I came up with these live studio sessions in part as a way for my millinery students in the costume production graduate program to be able to witness my work that they can't do that because we're not capable of all safely working in the costume shop under COVID. Um, so this stream, I, I hope that, well, I know some of them occasionally tune in or watch the recordings of the stream, which post to, I guess they're going to also now post to Instagram TV or IGTV with this portrait orientation and the landscape one where you have a much better uh, view of the details of what I'm doing, but just because you have a broader camera angle. Um, if you watch those videos posted there, then you can see sort of my techniques and tips and tricks and I, I know that some of my students have availed themselves of that and so I think my goal is achieved in that respect and now it's it's um, I'm excited that the stream in these two formats is giving me more audience members who um, come from other places and uh, can maybe learn from what I'm doing just because they're interested in hat making and so forth. So, uh, if I stabilized it, I have. So now I'm, I'm done with my little second loop. Put my glasses back on because I always talk about how bad my eyesight is. I have really bad eyesight and I always have. Like I think I got my first pair of glasses when I was four years old. Um, yeah, I was popular. <laughs> um, and I've always, you know, I've always had a career in the needle trades. I can see thread. I just have to, you know, take my glasses off and get up real close to it. Um, I think in my first studio stream, I had just recently had laser eye surgery for not to try to correct my vision, but to try to correct um, developing glaucoma. So anyway, I, I don't mean to be whining about my eyesight but now I need to pin this trim out on the hat and see what I think about it I mean I know I'm going to love it because like I've already done this once completely with just pinned together trim um, and that's how I decided I want to finish this hat this way um, if you're just joining me on this particular hat journey, this bicorn, this sort of Tim Burton inspired bicorn, is meant to be an entry in a um, online virtual art exhibition that is hosted by the WCPE, the Classical Station, I believe they're in Winston, they're somewhere here in North Carolina, but they stream online and they have an app and if you could, if you like classical music, they're really good. I mean, I, I support them as a sustaining donor. I'm gonna make sure that I haven't lost my needle, all right. I'm trying to stabilize my Oh, this is gonna be so cool. I might, I don't think, I think when I have it in the exhibit, you know, people will be able to see it online. And I suppose if somebody wanted to buy it, I guess I would sell it to them because these are hard times and I honestly don't know if I'm gonna have a theater job. That is it kind of, that's not true. I, I'm actually one of the lucky ones in that because Playmakers is it is in residence at UNC. I'm a professor in the graduate program there. And unlike many of my colleagues on Broadway, I do have work. Um, anyway, these are such rough times for this industry. I think they're bouncing back. I, I just had, uh, we had a panel discussion last week with small business owners in the field and 
we had um, a guest from Nashville who works with music stars there, and a guest from New York City who's a theatrical tailor for film primarily, but also theater. And um, Trisha, who is on the stream, I see in Instagram, her shop is based in Winston-Salem, but she works with clients worldwide. And all of our panelists were saying that work was returning. You know, the guy in New York was working on some stuff for uh, Mrs. Maisel and some stuff for the Halston movie. Um, the woman in Nashville, well, she works for Dolly Parton, so <laughs> she's got plenty of, of, of stuff to do. Uh, and Trisha was saying she's she teaches online um, as a costume pattern making academy, but she was also saying that um, the opera company that she works for in, um, I think it's Winston-Salem, was starting to film some performance that they would stream. Um, oh, I see in the chat, she says, one of my clients in Vegas is opening a show. So, you know, it, it's not that things are as dire as they could be, but they are for people who primarily service Broadway. Um, if your shop hasn't diversified into film, television, theme parks, and so forth, then they're really hurting right now. Uh, but I've digressed. So this, now I, I need to give it a rotation so you can see what this hat is actually going to be like. I wish I could take it off of here and put it on my head right now because it's so awesome, except it's pins into this dolly head, so I can't do that. But I really think that I have succeeded with this stabilization of the ribbon trims in such a way that, um, you know, it, if you look at it flower on, you know, it's the, the idea is that it looks like there's this giant bow that's stretching back across the, the bicorn with a big red hydrangea and rose ornament in the middle. And so that is succeeding definitely. And But you're not supposed to wear it that way. You're supposed to wear it so that it fans to the side like this. Um, so I'm pretty excited about this look here. And I think I'm, I'm ready to, to stitch all this on. So... Now I need to start taking it carefully off uh, so that I can really stabilize it. Oh, I was, I was talking about what happens if somebody sees this in the art show and wants to buy it because my thought was, well, of course I would sell it to them, but then now that I see it in existence, I love it and I want to wear it to at least an opening night before I pass it on to some other owner. Um, that may or may not happen, but, you know, it's going to be pretty sweet. I, it looked like, you know, envisioning this in my head, I thought it was going to be pretty awesome. Um, and in fact, it has turned out to be pretty awesome. But, um, oh, I see some love popping up in Instagram over there. And wow, I have much fewer viewers on uh, YouTube, which is, you know, that's where actually the best camera angle is for this. But um, I think I have so many friends through Instagram and former students and colleagues and stuff that I have a much more populated viewership over there. I will say the Instagram feed, we can only record this for an hour and then it'll just cut me off mid section, uh, you know, mid sentence. Whereas um, I could stream on YouTube just all afternoon if I wanted to. So, um, so you will on Instagram at 4 p.m. You're going to get cut off like that, even if I'm in the middle of something. But you could just pop over to YouTube and, and see what I'm saying or watch the video after the fact if you so desire. Um, anyway, I am taking this off of the head and I am... Oh, I need to swing tack this because I don't actually want this. I don't actually want the pinch in the bicorn. Like right now, when you look at it, it's it's kind of, I have a mask where the mouth is screaming like this and this like imbalanced figure eight sort of look. And I don't really want this to be pinched together where they're stitched back to back. Like I think what I want to do is maybe at the bottom of this 
first black stripe, or maybe even at the 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 join between the first white stripe and the second black stripe, do a swing tack uh, so that I have like a little finger woven chain about mm, a half to five eighths of an inch wide so that these aren't touching exactly, but there's air there. Um, that's more of that that philosophy that, that millinery isn't nailed together. It, it should, should look much more airy than that. Um, but I'm trying to get this thing off the head because I have pinned it out in a lot of ways. And I think, I think what I need to do is that, does that do it? Eee, come on. Yeah, I think I have to unpin where I've stabbed through and through. Yeah, here it comes. To come off of this head. And then I can stitch this down. And then I can put it actually on my head because that's what I really want to do now. <laughs> All right. So I have to rethread my needle and I'm gonna apologize in advance because I know this is gonna take a significant amount of time due to my blindness. Um, I, I, I'm glad that this is a virtual art show. You know, the first two hats that I worked on on this stream for the charity auction, which frankly they are now boxed up in the next room and they are coming to pick those up um, by the end of this week. I'm not sure if it's Friday or Saturday. I haven't heard back from them, but that is exciting news. Um, but they're boxed up and, and, and I guess I, in terms of my own personal style, the black one, if you recall, there was, um, a black felt cloche that had hand felted, um, red poppies, a spray of those on it. Um, that, that is something that I would wear in my actual life. It is to my taste. But the other one was, was really more... It, it was just not something that, like, it was pretty. I loved it, but it was also, like, I would put it, if I, if I owned it, I would just put it on a head in the corner and let it be room decor. Um, have I just succeeded? I have just threaded my needle. High five. I have to get a, a, a good needle threader. And, and let me ask audience in both places, if you have a needle threader that you like, um, please mention the brand or put a link in the chat because I just generally find them to be frustrating. Like the little silver ones with the loop of wire that you get for free in like hotel sewing kits and stuff, that tends to be the only kind of needle threader that I can find. And I feel like technology has to improve beyond, has to have improved beyond that. There has to be a better solution because it's, it's not, I'm not the only person on earth with poor eyesight who still manages to sew. Um, so I would, I would love to hear recommendations. If you have a needle threader that you're like, this is awesome. Try this one. Um, because yeah, I don't feel like I have enjoyed many awesome needle threading experiences. So to nail this down, I'm starting with a thread that matches the ribbon because I'm going to be, to start with, sewing into this cap of the hat. So the thread on the back side of the straw will just be inside of here against the hair of whoever's wearing it. But I'm gonna need to switch to black when I secure these elements of the bow that are going through and through to the outside of the fin. I'm going to need to do those in black. Um, or I guess I might on this edge of the ribbon, I might be able to do something and then disguise it. Like I was thinking about filling up the interior of this hat with a pile of either black ribbon or red flowers or something like that. So I might choose to do that, but definitely where I will be picking up the loop of ribbon on the inside of the loop. 
I can do that in black thread because you won't see that that's down inside of there. But I'm starting out here at the base and I'm going through and through. Actually, maybe I will start by picking up a bit of the ribbon and then stitching through. Yeah, that's a good plan. So I need to be kind of careful because I already went ahead and machined in the grow grain, which I thought I was saving myself time. In retrospect, I should not have done that. In retrospect, I should have trimmed it all out and then hand stitched in the grow grain as the very last step because now I have to be really careful that I don't sew that, catch that grow grain in, in stabilizing this trim because that would be ugly. That would be a point of poor quality. Um, but I'm, as, as I said earlier, I'm not really doing a lot of stitches here. It's really just a couple of tacks to, to stabilize it. And then I'll knot it off and move on to the other one. Yeah, I would totally wear this to an opening night. Totally. I don't know when there will be another opening night, but I know there will be. And so, unlike with the charity auction hats, where even if I wanted to keep them, that's too bad. The point of creating them was to donate them so other people could buy them. With this one, this for the art show, I could sell it to somebody if they saw it and they loved it, but I could also just decide that this is my hat and I'm, um, and I'm going to wear it. So, um, you know, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on that, if you think I should keep it, or if I should definitely sell it. Because frankly, like, I don't, one reason I don't make retail hats is because the average person that is, that would be buying a hat here in America is not willing to pay what I need to make financially to create hats. Like, making hats for the theater, it, you know, the, they're paying me to do my job whether I'm making a hat or rubberizing shoes or what have you. Um, and it's not about the price point of the hat. Well, I guess when I work on, when I work at a Broadway shop it is, but, but they've already dealt with the pricing of that. Um, but the point is, like, if I sell a hat retail to a client, like, they often don't want to pay more than $100, and by the time I'm done with this hat, I, I would want 250 for it. For the amount of time and unusual materials and creativity that's gone into it. Because I know on several occasions I have talked about this six inch wide satin ribbon that comes from the, I think sadly now out of business, ribbon dealer Mokuba, who sells super high end ribbon to primarily, you know, the high fashion industry and it's you know I, I i can't sell this hat for 25 dollars and and people are used to buying things at target that have been mass manufactured and they're like why is it cost so much and i'm like because i have all this expertise of 27 years of millinery and um that's worth something anyway <laughs> There's some stuff going on in the, oh yeah, some talk about retail um, pricing on hats and um, Beth Ninja Kittens in Instagram says, I think this is such a big and important issue across the artisan and crafting spectrum. It totally is. Um, none of us get paid what we're worth pretty much. And um, I question, I question where that, devaluation comes from you know um, anytime you're you're making a one-of-a-kind item with your hands and you have a skill set that is unusual you you should you should be able to 
at least survive on what you get paid to do that. And um, I'm having some issues with orienting my ribbon on this other side, and I think it's because I think it's because I have pinned it improperly there. Let's try this again. I have to say, like, this may be what I wear for Halloween. <laughs> I love this thing. Um, it's, it's, I, I, I hope to be able to wear it to an opening night someday soon, uh, but only if it's safe, you know. I have to say, like, I'm glad that, that there are areas of the industry where it seems like they're able to reopen safely, um, but... You know, I personally, not to, you know, confess too much about my own medical circumstances, but I have two medical conditions that put me at high risk for the virus. And, like, I want to get back to work as much as anybody else, but I'm not going to die to make theater. And I'm certainly not going to die a COVID death because that's a bad one. Um, so, you know, I, I've... It's been a sort of an existential crisis in the sense of like, I, whenever the, the theater determines that we can safely go back to work, does that mean that I can safely go back to work? Or does it mean that people who are at less risk can safely go back to work? And, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's a lot of deep thoughts lately about the, the future of my life and my art and my craftsmanship and so forth. Um, but this is pretty awesome. I don't even have the flower on yet, but like, <laughs> that's a lot of look. Um, but I, but you know, that's a lot of look, but I think I can rock it at an opening night. Um, and if I don't, I think I, I think somebody could, um, and I don't mean that I couldn't. I mean, if I don't, like, I don't wear it somewhere because I can't safely go somewhere. <laughs> but, okay, I think I have, I think I have that pinned out well on the opposite side. We've got one side of the bow here and the other side of the bow there. And then this flower is going to go in the middle. It's a lot of look, but yeah. Um... I should say too, I have set an alarm for four o'clock because ordinarily, you know, whatever's happening at the end of the stream, I try to make it just an hour, but, um, you know, sometimes we're in a discussion in one of the chats or, you know, it, it's just like, I don't want to end it abruptly, but here I am pulling off another thing of thread when I threaded this. No? I need another thing to thread. Um, yeah, I do. I nodded this off like I was going to be able to sew something with this like six inch piece of thread. And no, that was that was that was wishful thinking. Um, but I'm 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 accepting the reality now that I I do need to thread another needle. It's probably just subconsciously me not wanting to cope with that pain of trying to thread another needle. <laughs> Um, all right. So this week, um, in my millinery class, because I'm currently teaching millinery to a group of graduates and undergrad, I have two undergrads in my uh, millinery class. Normally, I, it's all graduate students or maybe continuing education folks unless we have um, advanced undergraduates who have the skill set such that we think they can keep up with a graduate class. And they, the students presented a third round of projects this week on, I think it was Tuesday, um, wireframe hats and we had you know, because of COVID, there's all kinds of, like, I'm not being a stickler about due dates and stuff because I understand that, like, like, for example, one student ordered some, uh, 
some stuff to be delivered that was part of their project. And there were shipping delays. And, and she's like, it hasn't arrived yet. Like, I can't finish the hat. And I'm like, yeah, I totally understand that. That's the world right now. Like, I'm the most laid back professor right now. Anyway, they presented this week. We saw three. It's a small class. There's only six people in it. Um, and three of them were able to, to complete the project on time. Um, and their wireframe hats, we had um, one lingerie hat, which is a, a type of hat that was popular in the Edwardian era. It's, well, actually it might be late Victorian as well. Um, you know, it is a wire foundation covered with transparent materials like lace and tulle and net. Uh, so it's, it's very frothy and, and very see-through and it's a lovely sort of summer style. That student did it all in black lace and black net and um, black lace applique. So it's more like a lingerie morning hat. <laughs> um, whatever, dude. It was beautiful. And, um, oh, I've stitched. No, I haven't stitched down. I've just pinned it down. Okay. I'm trying to stay on top of my grow grain so I don't stitch it down. Anyway, um, another student did a wire coronet. Like, it's sort of like when you see medieval art and there's a halo around Jesus or whatever. Um, and that student, the, the wire frame forms the coronet, and then she hand crocheted some trim to, to make this sort of starburst effect. It was, it was very reminiscent, I felt, of Alphonse Mucha, his artwork, uh, the way women in his pieces have a circle behind them. Um, it was really lovely. And... Oh no, I really did catch that. Okay, now I have to deal with getting my needle back through this ribbon. Or maybe I need to just accept that imperfections happen with a handmade item. I don't know. Still working on this. Oh, and the third student, I was talking about project presentations this week. The third student who had a completed headdress had created something inspired by, okay, if you are a super fan of Lord of the Rings, I'm sure that the character and the item probably have some name in Elvish. Um, at one time in my life, I too was a super fan of Lord of the Rings. It was when I was a child and um, all there was of the property was the books. But um, basically it's one of those elves that has a crown of like, it looks like sparkly twigs maybe. Um, anyway, it, the, the, that student fits, it did a really beautiful job with creating something that looked extremely organic out of, I mean, I know it was just brass jewelry wire and, and so forth. And it, anyway, um, there are pictures of some of them. I think I shared two of them on Instagram, um, both in my feed and in the stories. And um, I, I was just really pleased with how they are working within the bounds of what we have to what we have to practice now in terms of safe occupancy in the studio you know you can only have x at least at our uh, costume shop there can only be four people in the space at a time safely working so they have to plan their time so carefully um and i i haven't been in the studio since I guess I filmed part of my fall class, like a tour of the space video when nobody was there one weekend. 
um, back in, I think that was the last video fi I filmed before school started, like July or something. Um, so that's been rough, trying to teach people from a distance and not being able to see up close and say, oh, you should, maybe you, you could slip stitch that and hide your stitches a little better. Like on Zoom, I can't tell what kind of stitching they've got going on. And, you know, frankly, they could actually have hot glued it together and I would never know except, you know, I do ask them to leave the, the hats in the studio on the hat racks so that as the shifts come through, they can check out one another's work. And that's really excellent. So um, at, at least they're able to see what one another are doing. Um, yeah, it's closer here than on YouTube. Yeah, I, I, I know you, 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 you can see maybe the detail shot better um and then you can see how i've got the the tools spread out and such on youtube so i don't know i i feel like both um both places for this stream have pros and cons so that's that is part of why i decided i should figure out how to stream on both of them um and and also to just broaden a breadth of audience there's a certain i have subscribers on YouTube that I can see I have some of them who have signed in hi um, but I, I have also a lot of followers on Instagram and um, I, I appreciate being able to connect both places let's say that I think I'm to the point where I think I'm to the point where I need to switch to a black thread to be able to tack down these ribbon loops in such a way that that they go through and through the fin where you'll maybe be able to see it on the inside I haven't decided yet like I, I, I do like that when you see in there it's 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 like a an optical illusion of this black and white funnel put it so you can see it in both places um, so if I were to pile up the interior with more of, of this ribbon ornamentation, whether it was this red uh, satin ribbon or some other type of ribbon, like a black ribbon. Um, I was on YouTube, but I can't comment. I'll jump back on and forth. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Um, because I've literally just started streaming on Instagram and I don't really know how it works in terms of boosting you through that algorithm. I don't know how streaming there will affect my Instagram traffic and visibility, but I do know on YouTube that watch hours of these streams or watch time on these streams is super beneficial for boosting the visibility of my videos, which like the stream is is this happening now um but primarily that youtube channel is is instructional videos on the, you know little short things about like here's how to do this millinery technique and you watch it for like three minutes or 10 minutes and and those videos get boost in their traffic in their impressions of of showing up in other channels that have that are related and so forth um so it does help me to have watchers over there in terms of the videos that I have on there that are not streams. I, I'm, I'm enjoying the stream more on Instagram just because the, the chat is more um, voluble. Like there's more interaction and, and um, like I can see that you guys are commenting, but um, on, oh, Trisha has a good point on Instagram that on YouTube you maybe can only comment on the desktop, and and that may be true. You know, when I, I haven't really done a lot of watching of YouTube videos on my phone, so and certainly not streams on my phone, so that could be part of the issue because I think a certain number of people do. I mean, obviously on Instagram due to the orientation that's meant to be on the phone on uh, YouTube, 
I, I have a certain number of milliners that I know sign in from their laptops in their studios or their desktops in their studios. So um, anyway, this is all a long way to say that I'm going to continue to stream on both. And I love having audiences in both places. And I, I think that I need to change this app, this thread out for black because I'm sewing through and through the black. Sorry, my video got paused on Instagram because somebody called me and I have no idea who that was. Um, and I don't really care because I don't really talk on the phone unless it's like like my real estate agent because I'm trying to sell this townhouse that I used to live in before I moved in here with my partner who is downstairs on video calls and I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to keep us sonically separate but I feel like sometimes maybe the audio from downstairs video conference might bleed in so if you hear like some charlie brown adult <laughs> kind of stuff that that could be him downstairs um riley hasn't come by yet which is our cat who um he i think he has mixed feelings about this studio stream that i do because i'm here i've set up this millinery table in a front bedroom which has these windows here and these are his preferred people watching windows because there's a, a sidewalk uh, not on our side of, of the street but uh, on the opposite side of the street where a lot of people walk their dogs push their baby carriages um, jog things like that and he really likes to um, watch all of that so when I'm here working, I'm preempting his cat TV time. Um, sometimes he gets kind of testy about that. Now, he's not up here right now, but he may pop in before the end of this. All right. Put my glasses back on. Now, I, I started to say, and then I, I failed to finish the thought, I believe, that I've set an alarm for 4 p.m., and I think that I'm gonna, that the the screen the stream on Instagram will automatically end at that point anyway because you're limited in how long you can stream, and but on YouTube it's it's not like you can pop over to YouTube and it's gonna keep going because I need to sign off pretty much exactly at four, because I have um, I have an interview this afternoon with a a woman who's experience is going to contribute toward me, this chapter I'm writing. A colleague is writing a textbook. I agree to contribute some chapters and I've set up this interview with a woman who has worked at the New York City Ballet Shop for years and years about the designer Karinska. Uh, if you're into ballet on any level you know who Karinska is because she pretty much um, influenced all of 20th century ballet clothing construction, like when you um, learn how to make ballet bodices and the orientation of the grain line, which panels are cut on the bias to better allow the, um, the dancer to breathe and, and flex their rib cage and such. Like all of those are innovations that, um, that Karinska came up with in costume construction. Oh, she's also the one that created a yoke and dropped the tutu down onto the hips from the waist um, because she was really um, committed to using the waist as the foundation from which costume designs expand in both directions. And um, even with, you know, I mean, ballet dancers have not an ounce of fat on their body. They're extremely slender. Um, they're not hourglasses primarily. Well, we have some now. Um, but, you know, this is all a digression. I'm, I'm interviewing this woman about Karinska designs and how you reconstruct something when the designer's been dead for 40 years, but you're still, um, you're still remounting their nutcracker. Uh, so I have to go at four right on the dot so I can call her and or Zoom with her for that interview because I'm contributing to a book on that. I see Arlene is in the chat on um, YouTube. Hi, she's a co-worker at UNC Chapel Hill. When I rode a bus to and from work, we rode the same bus. And um, I see she says, good luck with the interview and the chapter. Thank you so much. Um, this is 
it's primarily a book that's being written by the head of my graduate, the graduate program I teach in and her husband on the history of costume making industry in general in the 20th century. So I have agreed to contribute some chapters on early designers and makers, primarily in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, who had their own construction shops. And that's really been fascinating to, um, they give me these dossiers of research and I, I read the, the articles and, and the book excerpts that are in the dossier and then I write a chapter. Um, and of course, you know, we've been talking about how that draft of the book has to be turned into the publisher by middle to end of this month, I believe. Um, but that, you know, we are now in a circumstance where the book can't be completed because Triffin, my coworker, uh, who has the contract for the book, she was going to go do a lot of, of primary source research in the Performing Arts Library in New York this summer. Well, nobody was doing anything in New York this summer except, you know, hiding from the virus or contracting it. So that didn't happen. So those chapters can't be completed until it's safe to go research in the stacks of an archive again. And then um, we can't really... Like, I don't know, this is a call that the publisher is going to have to make, but how can you talk about the professional costuming industry since the dawn of the 20th century without now talking about how it has been negatively impacted by COVID, you know? Um, and, and we won't know the end of that story and that influence until we've got a plan for dealing with the virus, right? Um, because... Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 going to be. Um, I, I feel like this book is is, is not going to come right out. You know, like the, of course we're just turning in the first draft, so we'll have uh, revision suggestions from the the editor. But I, I I feel like there there are chapters yet to be written that can't be written until. I don't know. Will there be a post COVID or will it just be? like the COVID we can live with safely or, you know, it, it's too much, too much is up in the air about what's safe research practice, what's safe work practice um, for us to be able to complete it, I don't think. Um, I mean, that's, again, that is the call of the editor and the uh, my two co-authors because my responsibility has primarily primarily just been um, to generate these chapters on historical figures, you know, and, and that's not going to change. Like, Karinska has done what she is going to do, and she's already dead. So, you know, I'm just talking to people who continue to make her designs and, and see how, how do you produce a costume when you maybe you hit a problem and ordinarily it would be a call that the designer would make and the designer hasn't been around for X amount of time. So that's really what this interview is about this afternoon. I'm very excited to talk to this woman um, because apparently she um, started out at the ballet as a shopper and um, moved her way up, has, has been a stitcher and a pattern maker and on the management team and has had all different kinds of positions there. And so in terms of having a, a very cohesive and broad uh, interaction with the, the reproduction of Karenska designs. She's seen it from a lot of different perspectives throughout the arc of her career because, you know, they're, they still mount the Nutcracker with the original designs by Karenska, but the original costumes that Karenska made are, you know, rags. Like, it, well, not rags, but, you know, You've got to remake them because bodies change, people change, you get new cast, something happens and one gets destroyed, you know, and, and they, I'm interested to hear what sorts of things she has to say about those remaking. Um, uh, Arlene asks in the chat over on YouTube, strictly theater or including Hollywood, question mark, and 
Um, I'm assuming you mean when work is going to get back on. I'm not sure um, because this clearly was asked at some point in my diatribe and I don't know what you were exactly referring to. Um, but Hollywood production has already resumed to a certain degree, particularly with um, the fact that movies, part of production on movies, actually, you know, a lot of Amer American release films aren't really necessarily even filmed in America. And if you can figure out how to get your talent and your crew to, oh, the history of theater costuming. Um, yes, okay, it's pr primarily, it is primarily theater costuming. It, it, the book is primarily uh, with respect to theater costuming, but there's, it's a gray area because all of the Broadway shops also produce things for film and television now. And in the early days, there was no television, you know? <laughs> and and you did have some cross, like Karinska designed costumes for Hollywood films. Like she was the first person to win an Oscar for costume design for Joan of Arc. Um, so of course we're going to make reference to that in this book, but it is primarily focused on professional costume production for whatever audience you know broadway theater is not the same as opera is not the same as ballet uh, but it, it's it's more about the level at which you're working where what you're producing is akin to what's coming out of couture shops but you're doing it for performance as opposed to just super rich people who want to look beautiful <laughs> oh just thinking of some of may west's outfits now, I have, this is sort of maybe beyond my pay grade within the context of the book because um, I understand that they are, the, I've been writing about uh, chapters on the early days of, you know, you know, some of the, the women and men that I've written about, they, they didn't have a chance to, to design for film because film was too, it was, it was too early in the development of the film industry. Um, Whereas I think Triffin and Gregory, who are my co-authors, are dealing more with the lineage of costume making. Like, so for example, I'm writing about Karenska, who, you know, did a lot with ballet. Karenska, when she sold her shop, um, sold it, sold a lot of it to Barbara Matera who, if you know of Matera's as a, a Broadway costume house, is one of the big, re well-known, reputable ones. Um, I was just talking today to Triffin um, because she came by with, with a donation that I'm going to film a video for my YouTube channel um, unpacking that donation because it's full of awesome stuff. Anyway, she came by and was saying that um, Karenska, a table for, or a, a, a cabinet a storage cabinet from Karinska's studio was uh, bought by or given to Barbara Matera and existed in Matera's and they called it the Karinska cabinet. And then when Barbara Matera passed away and subsequently a few years later her business was dissolved and sold off, that cabinet went to a costume house in New York City called Tricorn and they now have the Karinska cabinet. <laughs> and and uh, that sort of lineage is what I believe Triffin and Gregory are focusing on with respect to the chapters that they're writing. Um, so it's possible that they will talk about one of the costume houses that created clothes for Mae West because her outfits were incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know when this book is going to come out. Um, like I said, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions with respect to COVID and costuming, and, and that is maybe something that Triffin and Gregory will work out with their their publisher, which um, the publisher, as I understand it, it's Taylor and Francis, which um, do a lot of costume related books, both history and technique. Um, we were just talking, I hosted a panel for the graduate students about what to do if you have a book idea, you know, how do you get from an idea to a published book. And we talked about writing book proposals and, and at what point in the process do you reach out to publishers? Do you need literary agents and so forth? And um, we talked about, we had two people on the panel discussion who had published through Taylor and Francis 
um, and that it, in fact, ah, there's my ah, there's my alarm. Okay. Oh, okay. My Instagram video is going to end in 30 seconds. So, and I have to get off of here because I have to do that interview. And I don't think it's necessarily worth waiting for Instagram people to show up here because I do need to sign off and go have that interview. But that was all uh, stuff. That was all just sort of me blathering uh intending to get to the point that eventually this book will come out through Taylor and Francis. So if you're interested in it, I will of course announce it on my blog and YouTube and Instagram and so forth. Um, but keep an eye on releases from that publisher because I, I think it's probably going to take about a couple of years at the earliest for us to get to the point that it can be released. Um, but that's where it will come out. And I am only a tertiary co-author um, contributing the most minimal amount of stuff to that book. Um, but I'm very excited to read the content that I did not create for it because the subject matter is certainly quite interesting to me. Um, I just want to stabilize this I just want to stabilize this flower before I sign off um, because... I have, um, I mentioned this one, I had this circumstance once before where some friends were going to have a, um, a sewing circle sort of uh, circumstance and that is happening again this weekend and I would like to attend it so I'm, I may finish this hat off stream and it may be something that, that you just get to see the finished product show up on my Instagram or something. Oh man. That is a lot of look, y'all. That is a lot of look. <laughs> I mean, I'm here for it, but like, this would require quite an outfit to pull off. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I do have one that I could make this work with. I think I would not want my hair to be caught up in a hair clip. I think I would want it. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. All right. I'm going to end the stream. And um, thank you so much for dropping in and being part of my open studio today. And um, I'm going to do this, continue to do this every Thursday on both Instagram and YouTube. And it lasts a little longer here on YouTube. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And uh, subscribe to my channel if you want to get in an Instagram notification for when I do go live, because this is where it happens longest. I get cut off on Instagram now both times I've streamed there. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that I'm not going to continue to stream there. It just means it's not the full open studio experience. So thank you so much for tuning in. And um, I'm going to cut the stream off now.